First of all, I wanted to address of why I haven't made any videos <laughs> the last few weeks, the last few days, last week or so. And the reason is something is changing. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I just don't feel extroverted. I feel very silent, calm, and introverted. And it's like, I don't want to break that. It's such a beautiful thing, such a peaceful feeling. And it's something I've uh, previously only experienced by great effort, by doing a lot of sadhana. I have Mars exalted in my chart, exactly 28 degrees Capricorn. And it's also my Atma Karaka. So I'm pretty driven, you know. Um, anybody who sees my chart, knowledgeable in astrology, they say, wow, you must be rich like Bill Gates, you know. Or who is it now? Elon Musk. And I say, no, I don't really care for money much. Only as far as meet, uh, meeting my basic needs. But my fortune, my delight, and uh, my blessings are in the area of spiritual knowledge. And then they look at the rest of the chart and say, oh, oh yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> I have Jupiter and K2 in Scorpio in the ninth house. That's Ketu's uh, home. And Ketu takes away things. And when he's with Jupiter, he, this can lead to the complete atomization of all knowledge, is one way that uh, Bar Barbara Pijan Lama, one of the greatest astrologers around, uh, the way she expresses it on her site, that, in other words, one sees through all the different paths and symbols and metaphors and stories and realizes that because they are seen, because they are outside, they are objects, so they can't possibly be the truth. Ramana is very clear on this. He says that the truth, the self, Brahman, is only the seer, only subjective never objective. So then, see that this has been the theme of my work for a long time now. I postulated a long time ago that there has to be one teaching or one view that is like the context, the great context for all the others. It has to be a way, because God is universal. So if all of these paths are rooted in God and lead to God, then there must be a common point of view that reconciles all their differences and allows us to uh, relate them one to another in a way that doesn't diminish any of them, doesn't reject any of them. Because that's the defect of um, sectarian religion. Sectarian religion says, this is right. Our teaching is right. 
our guru, our scripture, our form of God or worship or whatever, this is the absolute truth. And of course, the corollary is, and all others are wrong. But if God is the creator and maintainer of everything, that means all those paths that you think of are wrong were also created by God. <laughs> so, you know, of course, they can't answer this question. And uh, the reason they can't answer it is that they're in duality. Duality says, this is right and that is wrong. This is good and that is bad. Right, left, up, down, inside, outside. See, it always makes a dichotomy or a pair of opposites for everything. So if you cling to one side of a pair of opposites, you have to deny the other side. This is Western logic, Aristotelian logic, binary logic. If you cling to the one, you have to reject the zero. See? So, I postulated, I said, there has to be, if there is an absolute, if there is a universal truth, it has to be beyond this dualistic thinking. It has to be beyond the state of consciousness that says, I affirm this thing and I deny the other thing, the opposite. There has to be a platform of, of viewing things such that there's no need for denial. There's no need to um, deny the validity of any other point of view. So that's what I call the esoteric teaching. I didn't know what it was, <laughs> but I knew I was searching for it. And so, you know, many years later, after many experiences and inquiring and studying many scriptures and practicing many different kinds of meditation, um, I knew I was getting close when I found the Buddha's original teaching. Now, not to be confused with Buddhism, because Buddhism, whether it's the Mahayana or uh, Theravada or Zen or Chan or whatever brand of Buddhist, Buddhism you may prefer, it's derivative. It's a religion, which means it's a dogma, a doctrine. And they even call it that. And that means it's sectarian. And here we go again. This is right and everything else is wrong. But if you read the original sutras of the Buddha, he doesn't have this kind of dualistic point of view. His point of view is that all duality is invalid. <laughs> Just like there's a wonderful sutra, the Vacha Gotra, Vacha Gotra Sutra. Vacha Gotra was a Brahmin. He was a very intellectual guy. And he approached the Buddha, trying to get the Buddha to take a position. And he asked him all kinds of questions. Is the, the most famous one is, does the Tathagata exist after death? Or does the Tathagata not exist after death? The Buddha said, not a valid question. 
and that he, he still he kept going. Is it that the Tathagata both exists and not exists after death? <laughs> or that the Tathagata neither exists nor doesn't exist after death? And Buddha said, not a valid question. So, and he went through many, many tries. Each of them, you know, wound up the same way. So finally, he was pulling out his hair. You can imagine, you know. Why don't you take any position? Don't you have any position on any of these topics? And some of them were quite interesting topics drawn from Upanishads and Vedas, Vedanta. But the Buddha said, it's a wonderful line that just blew my mind. He said, a position, Vacha, is something the Tathagata has done away with. He's done away with the whole idea of a position, that this is right and that is wrong, this is true and that is false, and so on. So in one short phrase, he just nullifies the whole world of dualistic thinking. So then, poor Vacha, <laughs> he's sitting there, his mind is completely blown. <laughs> like mine was when I first read it. And he says, well then, how do you explain the, the way things are? How do you understand things? And the Buddha said, it's like this. Because of ignorance, fabrications arise. Because of fabrications, consciousness arises. Because of consciousness, name and form. Because of name and form, six sense bases. Because of the six sense bases, contact. Because of contact, feelings. Because of feelings, become a clinging. Because of clinging, becoming. Because of becoming, birth. And because of birth, old age, death, rebirth, suffering, despair, and all the ills of mankind come into being. So then Vachu was devastated and he, he just said, well then, what can we do about this? But by the way, this is called the middle path. If you've ever heard of the middle path. And some people take the middle path to be a kind of compromise between enjoyment and austerity. But that's not what it is at all. That's a story that somebody made up about it. If you go to the original literature, the middle path means not to be for or against anything, but to simply see the chain of cause and effect that gives rise to the world as it is. So poor Vacha, after having his whole mental world devastated by the Buddha, he says, well, then what can we do about this? And the Buddha calmly explained, you just undo the cause and the whole chain falls apart. Get rid of ignorance. And that stops fabrications. Get rid of fabrications. That stops consciousness. Get rid of consciousness. That stops name and form. And so on. All the way down the 12 steps. It's the original 12-step program. <laughs> so the Buddha offers, in other words, a completely unique non-dual view of why things are the way they are and also how to escape this chain of birth and death, rebirth, and so on. 
And uh, he does it without denial of anything. When I read this, I was like, wow. Yeah. So I, I left, I was in Spain at the time that I was introduced to this. I left Spain, I went to Thailand. I didn't like Thailand because it was too Chinese. <laughs> um, so I came to Sri Lanka. That was almost exactly 10 years ago. And I'm just now staying in the same room, in the same family hotel that I stayed in then. Uh, so I became a monk. I became a monk, but unfortunately, the, um, the Sangha has become so, you know, overlaid with different people's opinions that are, that are different from the Buddha, I eventually, I had to withdraw from that. So I went to India and I rattled around India for a while here and there, wound up in Tiruvannamala on the advice of my astrologer. I have the best astrologer. He's so cool. He's the only astrologer who ever looked at my chart and like got it, you know, got who I was. And unfortunately, he doesn't do any online work. He says, he says, it, you can't be an astrologer online. You have to be with the person. You have to be in their energy field. You have to be able to feel them, you know, where they're coming from. And um, we had a talk because I also dabble in astrology. And there's a kind of a trance that you get into where you get to a certain level in a person's chart. And it's like you can see through the chart non-conceptually, non-verbally. And actually, it's almost like you can reach out and touch the person's karma. And you just know. Yeah, and he, we were talking about this, and he says, yeah, I get that all the time. But, you know, his family has been in, in astrology for the last 10 generations or something. So he's a very fortunate guy. So anyway, I wound up in Tiruvannamalai studying Ramana Maharshi's teaching. And this was the icing on the cake, you know. Uh, I had always thought that Nirvana or Brahman realization was something very far off, you know like maybe lifetimes ahead. And, um, but after five years in Tiruvannamalai, it's definitely within sight, if not within reach. So uh, it's a very powerful holy place, uh, especially if you can ignore the, the social level because that's got a lot of problems. And just contact the energy there and go right straight to the heart of things. That Arunachala is Shiva. It's not an abode of Shiva. It is directly Shiva. And the, I've told this story several times, so I'm not gonna tell it yet, how that became so. Um, but the experience of staying there, I mean, it put me through a lot. I was very much isolated and had a wonderful house. And after five years, you know, as a foreigner, you have to leave India every six months. But because of COVID, I was stuck there for like a year and a half. You know, thank you, COVID. <laughs> I got to stay there continuously uh, from March 2020 until 
just a few, just two months ago. So that really did it. And this time when I left Arunachala, I felt like no separation. Like Arunachala is here with me now and will be wherever I go. And I don't have to feel any separation anymore. Um, so something changed, something very deep. And just the last week or so, I've been feeling it very strongly that um, there's no need to continue these little daily videos and you know all this stuff. I've already said everything that I have to say or everything that could be said on so many subjects. If you look at the, the video catalog, video guide, which you can download from almost every video on the channel. Uh, there are videos that address the issues of each chakra and each state of consciousness on the progressive path. So I feel like my work is pretty much done. I've pretty much said everything I wanted to say. This only thing, the only thing that remains undone, at least in my mind, is that I never got to have uh, a real disciple. And now that I look back on it, it, that also is kind of a blessing. Because if I had had someone who was, you know, 20 years behind me on the path, it would have slowed down my progress. I would have always had to compromise for that person. I couldn't have done a lot of the radical things that I did. And because of that, I probably wouldn't have attained the state, you know, that I'm in now until much later. So because of this, I was able to move very fast. Um, when I look at the videos that I did, you know, even two years ago, it's like it was another person from a whole, a whole different point of view. So anyway, the passion is gone. Uh, the need to, to speak out, to address, to instruct, to um, give discourse, yeah, it's just gone. And uh, I'm only able to say as much as I'm saying now is because you're here. So, I guess um, either I'm going to leave the body soon, which is possible, because I've got an astrological thing coming up in the beginning of April that's uh, very heavy. Uh, so I may leave the body then, or I may not leave the body until Saturn goes into my 12th house, which is like a year later. Uh, but any, in any case, you know, I have to prepare myself for that transition. Well, actually, I don't. I'm ready for it to happen anytime. <laughs> Who am I kidding? Um, the only thing is I'd like to have my, my body of work in a, a little bit better shape, a little more accessible, a little more organized. And to have somebody in charge of it, like an archivist, that person hasn't showed up. Um, that way, people in the future may be able to get benefit from it. Uh, if, uh, you know, if anybody, if you know of anybody who would 
want to volunteer, I'm open. <laughs> so I guess that's it. That's kind of the latest news, you know. And I would, uh, I would now I would invite your questions on this topic or any other topic relevant to our work. Please, I invite you to use this time to ask the question and engage in dialogue with Swami G. It's very worthwhile, and please take this opportunity. It's special. Yeah, I'm not going to be around that much longer. I have the intuition. Swami G, I had a question. So, ah. is the state of realization a disidentification with the mind and thoughts, or it is like a manunvasha, which I had read in Ramana's work, which is a perpetual state of no mind or thoughtlessness, or the mind can be there and you are just distant? So, could you please explain? Well, if I understand your question, you're saying is a realization an active thing or is it a passive thing? I'm asking, is it a perpetual thoughtlessness or manunasha as Ramana would say, or is it that the mind and thoughts keep going and you are disidentified? I think it's more the latter. Because the body is there as long as the prayer of the karma is not exhausted. Body is there. Body has to be fed, watered, exercised, taken care of in so many ways. And similarly, mind is also there. So uh, mind is going. Uh, there are still dreams at night, for example. Uh, but one is aware that they're dreams. And when there are no dreams in Sushupti, one is aware of that. So I would say, yeah, it's more of a disidentification. Like the mind and body are over there someplace. You know, they're, they're not who I am. They're not what I am. But there's, some, there's something like, uh, distant cousins, <laughs> you know, they're not a close relative. But to speak of myself, the self is only awareness, it's only subjective. And if I'm aware of something, then that can't be the self. That has to be other, that has to be the objective or the object. Whereas the self is always the subject. That's why the self cannot be seen either in oneself or in anyone else. Because self is always subjective. Even the self in the so called others. Yeah. So one cannot see, just like. I cannot see my eye unless there's a mirror. But sometimes the self can be seen indirectly by its light. When the mind is purified by meditation, for example, sometimes it reflects the illumination of the self. And one sees lights, you know, or hears uh, beautiful sounds, music. And 
This is only because of the presence of the self. It's not because of the mind. The mind is inert. And it simply is a machine like a computer. It does what it's been programmed to do. Has no will of its own, has no consciousness. It only appears to have these things because of its association with the self and its reflection of the qualities of the self. So, yeah, I would say the state of realization is more of a, a detachment because that self is there all the time. Awareness is there all the time. But in most of us, it is identified with the body and the mind and activities and so on. So we're not aware of it separately from its, uh, how can I say, from its acquisitions, <laughs> upadis. You know what I mean by upadi? Yeah, so, um, the idea, the, the whole reason for so many different types of sadhana, work on oneself, is to remove the upadis, to quiet down the, the vasanas, which are the habitual mental tendencies, and to uh, expose the original nature of the self which has been covered over by them. But that's the only reason for it, because we are the self always. Yeah, that, that's why <laughs> I love that verse. What is it? Verse 33 of Uladu Narpada, huh? where Ramana says, if anyone claims to be enlightened or unenlightened, it opens broad grounds for ridicule. <laughs> because you can't attain what you already are. And you also you can't not attain it. <laughs> See, our language puts so many obstacles in our way. That makes it hard to adequately model the situation. That's why I think the study of Sanskrit is very important. And I'm so happy my Adi Guru uh, encouraged us. Well, in my case, he, he ordered me to study Sanskrit uh, because I was editing his books. <clears throat> So uh, Sanskrit is a multi-ordinal language. Every word in Sanskrit has, well, the way he described it, he said seven levels of meaning according to the de degree of conscious evolution. And every letter, every alphabet in Sanskrit has a whole array of different meanings and then they combine into words and so on. That's called matrika, from which our word matrix comes. So the matrika is the matrix of meanings that forms the Sanskrit alphabet, which is the means of creating the world. So to get out of the trap of the material creation, one needs to know how it was made. And the way it's made is through name, name and form. Name and form creates consciousness. Consciousness creates name and form in the Paticca Samupada. It's like a feedback loop. So the what I'm advising, you know, is that the uh, best way to approach the scriptures is to learn 
first of all, just to chant the Sanskrit nicely with the proper, there are three elements to Sanskrit. The mantra, which is the text, the matra, which is the rhythm, and the swara, which is the tune, the intonation. So they're all three together when they're right, makes the mantra effective and powerful. That's why you hear it in all the recordings that I made for this channel. You'll hear it as far as possible, as far as I'm able to uh, make the proper swara and matra and mantra. So. When one becomes silent, the creation ceases. And that's why Ramana said his main teaching was silence. Isn't that part of the Dakshina Murti Stotram? Also, yeah. Yeah, I was looking at that the other day. That he taught through silence. And isn't it funny, Ramana's place, especially when he was at the uh, cave, Virupaksha cave was on the south side of Arunachala. Not a coincidence. This is, you know, <laughs> this gets into like transcendental gossip. <laughs> Did you know that Arunachal was really Shiva? <laughs> I heard that Ramana lived on the south side, just like Dakshina. <laughs> You're not going to believe this one. <laughs> oh boy. Hey, if you can't have fun with this stuff, what's the meaning of it, right? Come on. We're not at church, thank goodness. What was that Nomi said? If you go to a satsang and you don't hear laughter, run away <laughs> as fast as you can. <laughs> yes. <laughs> because this is such a joke. I was talking to um, my hostess this morning. I, I live in a family owned uh, like a rooming house. And um, the family is, all, I'm old friends with them for over 10 years. And so I was talking with my hostess and we were talking about the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. Mula Pariyaya means the root sequence. And it's how the mind creates I or the illusion of I, the ego, the individual. It's a specific sequence of thoughts that gets attached to or overlaid upon every perception that comes in through the senses. So I was explaining this to her and we both started to laugh because it's such a joke, you know, how the, the mind fools us and fools itself into thinking this thing, this I, is real. And the way it does it is very tricky. It says, well, this is my microphone, and, and this is my camera, and this is my tripod, and this is my light. So if I have all this stuff, then I must be real, right? 
In other words, it superimposes this upadi of ownership, of relatedness. It said, this is mine and that's mine and the other thing is mine. So I was me real. Because there's absolutely no proof that the I, the ego, the, the uh, false identity, the individuality is real. This is a big problem in philosophy. Has been for thousands of years. That nobody can prove the existence of the world, the mind, the body, the ego, or the individual, because any evidence that you would bring forth to prove it has to come from the same world. You see, it's like you find someone stealing and you say, okay, prove that you're not stealing. You know, but everything the person has is stolen. <laughs> everything they have is false. See, so anything that you would bring forward as evidence, say, to prove the existence of the world is also from the world. Anything that you would use to prove the existence of the individual is also a product of an individual. So it's not valid. It's not valid evidence. What would be needed is another equivalent world that we know is real. And then to find similar features or similar uh, qualities in our world to say that, oh yeah, see, this world is just like that other world that we know is real. But there ain't no such thing. And Ramana shows us how to find out what is real. And it turns out once you know to look, you see that it is there all the time. The thing about reality is that it's always real. You know, you just have to hot, notice. Hot bang, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> and that's the thing. Most of the time we don't notice because our intelligence is covered by all these upadis. We let the go ahead. Bro. Oh, I um, had some uh, an insight this this week, um, and I had was uh, reflecting back on the last talk about karma. And I was walking my dog, and uh, I'm always uh, I'm starting to really rest in that space now, and realizing. Uh, you know, I, I refer to it as the incomprehensible choreography of Ishwara. It just goes on. It includes everything, including the fact that I might fall flat on my face on these lovely roads of Panama. Uh, and that's all, it's the whole package deal. And as long as I don't, you know, I love that metaphor of the elephant's trunk that goes out and starts touching things as long as uh i i understand this 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 emptiness it's it's fine whatever ishwara whatever dance ishwara would like to dance uh it does not affect this emptiness unless unless the elephant trunk goes oh a peanut <laughs> And touches something, and that to me, then now you've now you've stuck karma there. You've stuck to you a little bit of karma or a big bunch of karma. As long it, as as soon as you touch it, as soon as you say that's me or mine, 
And so my my work with myself now is uh, don't touch anything. And if you must, drop it like a hot rock. <laughs> but sometimes, uh, you know, it's like, well, yeah, but I really like this hot rock. I love it. I'd like to, you know. <laughs> But yeah, no, it's coming along. There's a sh there's a shift that you know. Again, another thing I'd like to kind of take an opportunity to, to share about uh, for quite some time, this really felt like there was an I making this effort to go within. Now, now the sense is that um, there's a resting within. It's it's re it's rest. It's resting. And the more I rest, I mean, it's like, you know, kind of like being in the God's recliner. You know, the more you sit there, it's like, oh, yeah, this feels pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, it's turned into resting in the heart. And I don't feel like there's an Evelyn that's like, God, I got to do this. I got to do this. Or Richard will get mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> and you well, also you described uh when you were talking about your what you've learned about dealing with uh all this so-called stuff you described exactly what kumar was asking about you know uh and what you're doing is you have just disidentified with it. It's still there. The dog is still there. But uh, uh, to say it one way, the dog isn't you anymore. Yeah. Yes. And I'd have to add the fact that I think I can control the dog. <laughs> here, boy. Here, boy. <laughs> it runs the other way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, I feel very blessed beyond words. It is beyond words. Yes. That's the whole point. All this stuff we've been talking about, they're actually talking, it doesn't do it justice. Can't do it justice. No, can't. So Ramana says that this wordless space of resting in the heart, the awareness space, he calls it, resting in the heart, because the self does nothing, mm -hmm. nor is it the receiver of action. So what does the self do? You know, chills out. <laughs> That's as it should be, because the whole world is based on doing. Yeah, let me go here. Let me do this. Let me get that. Yeah, and, and again, you know, go ahead. Going back to Ramana's example of you know the guy that gets on the train with the luggage on his head, he thinks he's doing all that. I'm going. But here all he has to do, all yeah. he has to do, is put the luggage on the rack. <laughs> he doesn't have to go through all that. Oh, what a concept. And, <laughs> and it will still arrive with him without any problem, without That's any right. effort. See, we're all going through what's called prarabdha karma. Yeah. Prarabdha means ripe. It's mature, it's ripe, it's ready to drop in this life. So that's going to happen. And whether we do anything about it or not, whether we fight it or encourage it or not, it's going to happen. That's karma. Yeah. So why should we make any effort? 
let it happen. Yeah. And more than that, if we either fight it, resist it, or make efforts towards it, one, the karma is going to happen anyway, and two, that creates kriyamana karma for the next life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, like Ramana says, the best policy is simply to be quiet. Yeah. What does he say? Just remain quiet and see what strange things are going to happen. <laughs> yeah. I've been reading a lot of Ramana's books lately. <laughs> Now we are coming to the end of the hour. We have another few minutes. And if, Already? if there are more questions or more dialogues, this is the time. So I feel like I've only just found you and you're leaving already. <laughs> so that was a bit of a shock. But um um yeah you've got a thousand four hundred videos to go through i know exactly so my questions are limited um because i still have so much to look at um but i'd be really interested to know where i can find the original sutras from the buddha ah uh, there's a site called suttacentral.com yeah. Thank you. S U T T A C E N T R A L, suptacentral.com. It's state of the art. It's got all kinds of cool features. You'll love it. And um, alternate translations of all the different sutras, even alternate versions that were found in China and stuff like this. Really good site. Thank you. Perfect. <laughs> and one of the things that uh, Swamiji and at a smaller extent I have found is going back to the original writings is really worthwhile. It may take a while to understand them. There are some books like uh, Shankara's work that I start a book and it takes me a year to read it, but it's mm -hmm. a year well spent. Mm -hmm. We have time for one quick comment. Um, one of the things I've noted this is such a lot of so many popular books on I was awakened and here ha and people have, you know, really uh, grabbed hold of them because it offers some kind of clue for them. But what I find missing in people, they have no solid spiritual foundation in terms of have they read anything? Yes. Um, and they don't. They don't have that. And so they sort of float around on these popular topics and uh, get frightened off by something that's not in English or is translated or looks like it would take some, some work. And that's, that's a crucial missing piece for people. Yes. So yeah, there's no, no boot camp you can go to and get all of that foundational stuff. Yeah. That's why I made a, a conscious effort especially in the beginning of this channel, to supply that yeah. in an organized way. Yeah. So um, really, I recommend highly to download the, it's called Dharmasar Video Guide. And there's a link on all the older videos is in the video description. And you could download this and it goes through Chakra by chakra. Mm -hmm. And there shows all the video series that are related to that level 
of energy, that level of consciousness. So and the, there's a great introductory section where it basically gives the foundation for all this. And if you look at both Ramana and uh, my teacher Nomi, they were both uh, realized in their teens, and yet both of them, after realization, took the time to read and study and understand the classics. Yeah. Because they are the standards. Yeah. And uh, everyone who is familiar with them will use the same terminology. So just like any kind of specialized knowledge has its own shop talk, you know? <laughs> talk, talk to a printer sometime. Huh? Well, we're going to go four up with full bleed and, you know, uh, negative impressions and blah, blah, blah. You know, what are you talking about? Well, it's printer talk, printer shop talk. Or like in our field, uh, computers. Oh, what a lingo that, that there is in computers. Yeah. Right? All kinds of al alphabet soup, you know. And it's the same way in spirituality. There's a certain shop talk, and it originates in these original literatures. So to be familiar with them is extremely valuable because not only does it give you the, the view of the ancients, but it gives you a language, a standard language that everybody who is anybody in the spirituality will know. And you can use that terminology to communicate about things that are so far out of ordinary everyday experience, you know, that no, almost nobody knows what they are. It can so, be confusing. Yes. It can be confusing, though, because uh, sometimes the same words are used differently in different branches of the teaching. Uh, one of the things I had to sort out for myself, like Swamiji, I had 25 years in Buddhism before I discovered Ramana, and in Buddhism they say no self. And in Advaita, they say all self. And it took me a while to understand that that's the same thing. It's because Buddha uses negative logic and language. And the Vedas, for the most part, use positive language and, and nomenclature. Yes, so the so Buddha says say life is full of dukkha translated as suffering, and Ramana said, we all want always to be happy. But they're saying the same thing. Same thing. So, yeah, and we want to be happy experience. right here. That's why, that's why we have joined uh, Swamiji today. And I think we're going to have to come back next week because our time is up. Thank you so much. For coming today mm -hmm. and thank you Swamiji for being with us. Thank you all. Mm -hmm. All touch set. <laughs>